Amen. You all can have a seat this morning. Hopefully you guys are doing okay. I was uh, looking at my watch. You know, you get a, a message on your watch. I was making sure it wasn't a text message. It was a weather alert saying it's going to be less humid today. So that's something that you can all look forward to um, this morning. Well, listen, it is good to be together with you this morning. We are in our Haggai series, and today we're going to be in chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 9, so you can go ahead and find that. Uh, as you're looking for that, just a reminder, we are considering our priorities in this series, considering our priorities. And I'm going to give you just a little bit of background uh, to catch you up to speed. If you missed last week, no worries at all. This is going to bring you fully up to speed. But you'll remember last week, Pastor John really kind of set the stage for where we are headed and really kind of teed everything up for where we were going to be today as we start in chapter 2. But going back, the Israelites, they're now out of captivity from Babylon. They've been there for a while. Out of captivity in Babylon, Zerubbabel, the leader, he brings the Jewish people back into Jerusalem. When they arrive, they find that the temple has been destroyed, absolutely laid to waste. And so they have nothing. They, all they have as they look at this is just a big pile of ruin. So as they come back into Jerusalem, God says, okay, listen, you're now out of captivity. You're back in Jerusalem. I want you to rebuild the temple. That is now the priority, the assignment. That is what you are to be about, rebuilding my house, rebuilding the temple. Now, what's interesting about the temple is the fact that, and listen, one, one pastor I read said it like this. He said, the temple to the Old Testament Jew is what Jesus and the cross is to us. And so as they walk back into Jerusalem, yes, it, it, it's been destroyed, but they're out of captivity. God has now called them to this new work, rebuild the temple. So they get on it. They, they, they jump in. They start rebuilding the temple. This is a clean slate, a fresh start for the Israelites. And so they're on this, they begin laying the foundation of the temple and then something happens and frustration, discouragement sets in, a little bit of opposition and they shut the project down. And for 15, 16 years, they turn their back, they walk away and they, instead of keeping their priority focused on God, they turn their priority and their focus to themselves. And so God sends Haggai in with a message. Haggai delivers this message. I'm gonna sum it up. Here was the message. Why in the world do you continue building up your own houses? Why are your houses getting upgrades while my house continues to lie in ruin? And so that is the message that God sends Haggai into the Israelites with. They receive the message. They hear this message, they receive it, and it's convicting to them. And so what they say is, yes, absolutely, we, we, we need to refocus. We need to reprioritize. We need to put God back, number one. We need to be about rebuilding the temple. So as we move through this and we get ready to jump into chapter two, I, I wanna mention this. As I was going through this, one of the things that struck me was as a people in general, this is not all of us. This is just most of us. I'm unfortunately in this camp. When we start projects or when we start really anything, we're really good at starting things. Not so good at times at seeing those things all the way to completion. Now, listen, I don't know what it is for you. It could be a number of things. It could be an, a diet program, exercise program. It could be painting that fence. It could be building this over here, doing that over there, whatever it is. Right now, I'm in the middle of a garage reorganization project. Now, I've been in this project for the better part of a year. My wife would tell you every bit of a better part of a year I've been in this project. Now, early on, when we first started the project, we moved a couple things around in the garage. I knew what that was gonna lead to. That was gonna lead to, we were gonna have to reorganize. And I was actually very excited. I was excited, I was pretty jazzed about being able to do this project. So you get into these projects, right? And, and what, for whatever reason, if you lose focus or you lose excitement or you lose motivation, Many times those projects you started, you don't finish. And so what happens right now is I come home every day, I'll open the garage door. And as I open that garage door and I'm pulling up into the driveway, and I'm, I'm not kidding you when I say, it's almost, it's almost as if the garage is laughing at me. I mean, I can't explain it, but I look at it, it looks at me. And the way I handle that is I, I pull in, I get out of the car, I open the door into the house and I close the door. And that's how I deal with that. But 
I know that eventually I'm gonna have to get back on that project. But when, what, what happens to us many, many times, good at starting things, not so good at times at finishing. You know, you can think about this on a broader scale. You can think marriages in our country. I mean, are we ever great at starting marriages in this country? Not so great at times at finishing. You know, if you wanna boil this down just a little bit and really kind of get personal with this, think about your, your personal walk with Jesus Christ. You know, there are times in our lives where we find ourselves, and you will, you'll have this conversation with yourself where you, where you say, you know, my, my relationship, my walk with Christ is not where I want it to be. I want it to be more. And so what do we do? We, we refocus and, and we, we kind of reprioritize and we get back in there and we're actually excited. And we wake up that next morning and we start reading. Some of you may even pull in a commentary or two, really just to really understand exactly what the scripture is trying to tell you. You're praying for those people that you said you'd be praying for. Not only are you praying for them, you're actually writing down your prayer requests. I mean, you're all in. But too often for so many of us, we can find ourselves after time losing a little bit of motivation, losing a little bit of focus, and we find ourselves back into that kind of that same lackluster approach to our walk that too often happens to us. And it happens to me at times. And so that's where we find the Israelites 2,600 years ago in Haggai. And this is where we pick up in chapter two. We're gonna be in verses one through nine. Remember, God has called them back to, I want you to rebuild the temple. This is the mission that they have been called to. And so then we find ourselves in verse one. It says this, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. And so right out of the gate, we run into a date. So as I was preparing for this message, one of the things I discovered is what that is on our calendar today. It's um, actually October 17th. This also happens to be my wife's birthday. So it's a very special day we're talking about here. But, but really we have this date as really a reference and so we now know it's been about two months since God sent Haggai in the first time to have this, uh, send this message to the Israelites. Conviction sets in, they get to the project again. And so we find out through this date that they've been on the project now for about two months. Took them about a month to gather all the materials. They've now been working for about a month. But something happens, they get sidetracked, lose focus, things get derailed a little bit. And we pick up in reading verse two. It says this, speak to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and to the remnant of the people. And then listen to this. Listen to these questions that he asks. He asks this, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem like nothing by comparison? And so Haggai speaks to the leaders, Zerubbabel, Joshua, not the same Joshua from way back in Moses' time. We'll talk about him in a moment, but Zerubbabel and Joshua and to all the people. And he says, listen, how does it look to you now? I mean, how does it look to you with your own eyes compared to how you used to see it? And this question that he asked, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? So what in the world is he talking about? Well, Pastor John helped us understand that he's talking about Solomon's temple. And really these questions, they're kind of rhetorical in nature, but they're really meant for the elders of Israel, those who would remember the temple. And so what happens is Haggai asked this question, how does it look to you now? How does it look to you now? And so the elders are thinking back and they remember, they remember Solomon's temple. I mean, they remember the cedar walls and the cedar floors. They remember the elaborate carvings and the gold that was brought in from Arabia. They remember the massive pillars. And so as they're remembering, Haggai's asking these rhetorical questions. And one of the things that was interesting as I was reading, I, I, I took a little bit of a detour and I started reading about Solomon's temple. Both articles I read, the author was comparing and trying to figure out what would, be to, what would the cost be in today's dollars to rebuild Solomon's temple. And so what I found out just in reading, they pegged it anywhere between three and six billion dollars to do what Solomon did. And so we understand that Solomon spared no expense, no expense at all in rebuilding the temple. And the elders of Israel remember it. I mean, they remember the splendor of the walls. And now they stand in a place where there are no walls. 
and they stand on this foundation that got started about 15 years ago and they look around and they still see dust and rubble and ruin and weeds. And so they're frustrated and they're discouraged. And so how do we know that they were frustrated and discouraged? I mean, we all would be a little bit, right? But we know that they were frustrated and discouraged because obviously we read about it and if you don't have to, you can. You can turn over to Ezra chapter three. We're gonna be in verses 12 and 13 for just a moment. But listen to this. Listen to what happens with the elders who remember what it used to be like. Verse 12. But many of the older priests, Levites and family heads who had seen the first temple wept loudly when they saw the foundation of this temple. But many others shouted joyfully. And then listen to this. The people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shouting from that of the weeping because people were shouting so loudly and the sound was heard far away. So in one camp over here, yes, the temple has been destroyed and that's terrible, but, but they know they're now out of captivity and they've been called to something new. And there is joyful celebration over here as to what God has called them to. And you contrast that over here, you have this camp, they're, they're so focused and so consumed and so preoccupied with what used to be, they can't even see the potential and the opportunity that was in front of them, what God had called them to. And, and what was so interesting about this is the fact that the, the people that are just kind of watching what's happening, they have no idea what's going on because it's so loud. You've got so much weeping over here and so much celebration over here. It's so loud that people don't even know what is going on. And then we find ourselves back in verse four of chapter two. Remember, Haggai has just asked these rhetorical questions. How does it look to you now? And then he says this, even so, even so, be strong, Zerubbabel. This is the Lord's declaration. Then he says, be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. This is the Lord's declaration. And then he says, work, work for I am with you, the declaration of the Lord of armies. And I love how that is ended right there. It's almost like this, this 50 pound stamp just kind of stamped this right at the end. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. And you wanna talk about an emphasis. God is making a point right here. He is making an emphasis. He's trying to communicate something to the Jewish people. And three times he says, be strong. In verse four, be strong, Zerubbabel, be strong, Joshua, be strong, all you people of the land. Three times God says, be strong. Now, I don't know if this rings a little bit of a bell for you in another conversation that happened that was very, very similar, much, much earlier in the book of Joshua. Moses has now died. Joshua is now to inherit the leadership role of the entire nation of Israel. So Joshua is stepping into this role, this brand new leadership role, and that's not easy for anybody. But Joshua steps into this role. And then, and then what happens? Not only is he now assuming the, the, the mantle, the leadership role, he is given an assignment and it's not a small assignment, it's a pretty big assignment. Joshua, I want you to take the nation. I want you to cross the Jordan. I want you to go into the land I promised you. I want you to take it over, everything, all the land, all the inhabitants. Now, I don't know about you. I tried as I was reading that, how would I feel if I were in Joshua's shoes? How would I feel? God says, Brian, you're now the leader. You're gonna take the nation across the Jordan. I want you to take over the entire land. I know how I would feel. How would you feel? I wonder if Joshua felt something very similar. I wonder if Joshua felt like I would feel and kind of having a little bit of a nervous breakdown inside thinking, okay, how in the world am I gonna take over this nation? And then how am I gonna take them over into this land I know nothing about and conquer this land? And three times, God says to Joshua, Joshua, be strong, be strong, be strong, for I am with you. Now listen, I don't know if the Israelites in Hag with Haggai, I don't know if they equated or thought of that interaction between God and Joshua all those years ago, but here's what God was saying to the Israelites through Haggai. He's saying, listen, my promise still remains. My promise still remains. That same promise I made to him is the same promise I'm making to you. Be strong because why? I am with you. 
And so as you guys think about that, I mean, just think about here at Jersey. I mean, think about what we are walking through right now. I mean, we, we eventually are going to watch Pastor John hand the baton off to somebody else. We are gonna be in our own transition. And for a lot of people that, that can be unnerving, that can fill people with, with uncertainty and doubt. We can lose motivation, we can lose excitement, we can lose focus. But through all of it, what God is calling us to is, hey, listen, I am with you, be strong, all you people of the land. And that is the promise he made to the Israel. It's a promise he made to Joshua. It's a promise he made to Israelites with Haggai. It's the promise he is making to us today. Be strong for I am with you. Now, listen, I'm just gonna hit the pause button here just, just long enough to ask a question. And maybe the Holy Spirit's already kind of at work in your heart and you're already wrestling with this question. Maybe you have been coming in here, but what what is that thing that God is calling you to do? What is that thing that God is calling you to do? What is that thing he's calling you to do in your personal life? What is that thing that he's calling you to do in your family life? What is that thing he's calling you to do in your workplace? I mean, students, I mean, I don't have to tell you this, you're you're going back to school in a matter of weeks. And I don't care if it's homeschool, private school, public school, you're going off to college. I don't care what it is. What is that thing that God is calling you to do in your school? Because here's the thing, God is calling all of us to something. He's calling all of us to something. I don't know what it is for you, but he's calling you to something. He's calling us to something as a church. He's called us to a mission. But what is that thing he's called you to do? And so then listen to this, as you think about that, jumping into verse five, he says this, this is the promise I made you. This is the promise I made you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. So when you start answering that question, what is that thing he's called you to do? He's saying, listen, my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. And so Now listen, what what is God doing here? Because for the Israelites in this moment, as they listen to this, God and and Israel, when he called them out of Egypt and Moses and the Exodus, I mean, this was everything to the Jewish people. This was everything. And so God in some way connecting the dots with what God did then with what he's doing now, this would have been huge for the Israelites. Absolutely massive for them full of so much encouragement. You know, it's, it's almost as if God is the coach in the locker room at halftime. The team isn't performing so well in the first half. He gets him in the locker room and he's saying, hey, listen, get out there, get to work. You can do this. I know you can do this because I am with you. I am gonna help you through this. Now get back out there and let's get this thing done. And then we find ourselves in verses six through eight. Listen to this. For the Lord of armies says this, once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of armies. The silver and gold belong to me. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, Guys, don't don't get so hung up on this. Don't get so fixated and focused on, on what you don't have. It's all mine. It belongs to me. All of it belongs to me. I'll take care of it. I will take care of it. And then in verse nine, listen to this. Listen to what he says to them. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first, says the Lord of armies. I will provide peace in this place. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. What, it, what is he saying to them? He's saying, listen, you, you thought Solomon's temple was pretty amazing. That is nothing compared to what I am going to do with it into the future. You, you thought Solomon's temple was full of splendor and amazement. You, you have no idea, but what I'm planning to do is going to dwarf what that was. And guess what? You get to play a part in it. God is saying, yes, this was nice. What I'm doing is going to be far better, far more glorious than what this ever was. And I have called you to play a part in it. And that's what he was calling the Israelites to. Now, here's the thing. 
when, when, when God calls you to do something, we know this, we have to get to work. When, when, when we respond, we know, okay, we've got some work to do. I don't know what the work is going to be, but there's gonna be something that we have to do. And you know, at times there are gonna be times where we gotta get our hands in there, our hands are gonna get dirty. There are times we're gonna have to get in there and roll up our sleeves. There are gonna be times that we might even have to lean in and maybe put our shoulder into it a little bit. But, but listen to this. And, and I, I missed this when I read it. You know, I had read this several times. I missed it each time I went through it. So I wish I could claim this is my own, but I, I found it in a commentary, but I'm gonna share it with you. This, this is pretty amazing because listen, we know this. God is going to call us to something. I don't know what that is for all of us, but he's gonna call us to something. He's gonna call us to something as a church. We've been called to a mission of caring for people and connecting them to Christ. But he's gonna call you to something He's gonna ask you to get to work. He's gonna tell you to be strong. He's gonna tell you that his spirit is present among you and he's gonna tell you not to be afraid. And then guess what else he's gonna do? As if that's not enough already. He's going to do the heavy lifting. Watch this. He calls the Israelites to rebuild the temple. And then watch what he says. I want you to rebuild the temple. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will shake the nations. I will fill this house. I will provide peace. He called the Israelites to be about something. And then he says, yes, I want you to get to work. Now watch what happens when you get to work. I'm going to do the heavy lifting. And I think we can find a tremendous amount of peace and rest and encouragement and confidence as we move into what God has called us to do. Yes, let's get to work. Let's be about what he's called us to, but let's rest in the fact that he'll do the heavy lifting and that he will be with us each and every step of the way. And you know, it, it's, it's amazing that in true fashion, all throughout scripture, you find this over and over and over again. It's a reoccurring theme. God keeps his promises. He kept them with Joshua as he led a nation across the Jordan. He kept them with the Israelites as they came out of captivity and began to rebuild the temple. He kept them throughout his word. He's still keeping them in our lives today. That's who he is. That's what he does. And, and listen, you know, I, I think that we, we have to remember this as we read this text, this passage of scripture, we, we have to, to remember this. God, because what God is ultimately doing with them is he's calling them to something greater. He's trying to call them away from what used to be, from their past. And he's calling them to a glorious future. Now, th this is not new news for any of us. God will never call you to your past. God will never call you to your past. He won't do it. And he certainly wasn't calling the Israelites to theirs. What, what was he trying to do? He was trying to call them out of what used to be. And he was trying to call them to something far greater, something far more glorious. And what he's telling them is this. He's saying, listen, I've called you to do something and what you are doing today matters. And it has a glorious future. And so for all of us, what, you might say, well, Brian, okay, in light of all of that, what would you say to do? What would you say that we need to do in light of all of that? Well, I, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you to do what God told us to do. And, and God told us to keep going, to keep moving forward, to get to work and to be strong. And so as we think about that, I wanna go back to that question I asked earlier. What is that thing? that God has called you to do? What are those things that he has called you to do? For some of you, it could be something pretty small. For some of you, he may be calling you to something that you think right now is completely beyond you, kind of like Joshua. But whatever it is, whatever he has called you to do, I want us to find encouragement in the fact that if he has called you to it, he will equip you for it. And in the same way he was calling Israel to be about the mission that he had called them to, Jersey, he has called us to a mission. And again, that mission is to care for people and connect them to Christ. And what's so amazing about what we get to do here at Jersey, that gets to play out in so many different ways across the life of our church. And when we walk out of here and when we take Jersey and Jesus out with us, God is calling us to something far greater than ourselves. And what he's saying to us is the same thing he said to the Israelites. Listen, you are a part of something and what you are doing today matters and it has a glorious future. 
So Jersey, let's be encouraged as we are about the work that God has called us to do. And you know, a lot of times he's gonna call you to do something day after day after day after day. And when you wake up tomorrow, guess what he wants you to do? He wants you to do it again. And so let's be about the work that he has called us to do. And and if I can just quickly, I'm gonna end with this. If I could just take us back to chapter two, the second part of verse four and verse five. It's actually our memory verse. You can find it on the stickers that are on the tables as you walk out if you haven't grabbed one already. But this is our memory verse for this series. Listen to what it says. It says this, be strong, all you people of the land. Be strong, all you people of the land. This is the Lord's declaration. Work for I am with you, the declaration of the Lord of armies. This is the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. And so church, let's get to work. Let's be about the work that our heavenly father has called us to. And let's be encouraged as we do the work that he's called us to do in our church and in our personal lives. Let's be encouraged. How can we be encouraged? Why can we be encouraged? Because the declaration of the Lord of armies told us that he is with us. Let's pray together this morning. Father, I just wanna thank you for this time that we've had to worship you. Um, And Father, I pray that whether it is through something that we have been able to sing this morning, you know, as a church, we were able to vote on a ministry action plan. Father, this is just our our financial future. And and Father, I, I, I wanna thank you for the faithful, financial giving that this church has always done and always been a part of. Father, it it just allows us to really kind of propel things forward. It allows us to dream and and, and do things that you've called us to do. And so Father, we, we sit here with excitement as we think about what our next church year will be about and to be a part of that. And Father, then even more than that, Father, knowing that you have called us to something and knowing that if you've called us to it, you, you will equip us for it. And so Father, I pray that we would find rest, we would find encouragement, we would find peace, we would find confidence, knowing in everything that you've called us to, Father, that you will walk with us. And if we would be about the work you've called us to, Father, we can rest in the fact that you're gonna be right there doing the heavy lifting. And so Father, I pray that we would let go of the weight Father, and give it to you because you, you, you want it and you, you want to do it. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Father, I pray that as we sing this song, Father, that you would just be at work in the hearts of, um, of all of us. Father, I pray that whatever it is you're calling us to, Father, I pray that we would take steps toward that in these next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen.